Welcome to the first installment of this fall's Interdisciplinary Conservation Seminar Series, uh, hosted by the Human Environment Systems Group at Boise State uh, and the Interdisciplinary Conservation uh, Seminar Series in Canada. Uh, before we get started, just a few logistics. Uh, first, my name is Matt Williamson. I'm an assistant professor here in the department. I use the pronouns he, him, and his. Uh, in case you're concerned, the session will be recorded. You'll get a link in the follow-up email following today's session. You're all muted uh, for now. Remember that when you go to ask questions at the end. I'm going to ask you to turn off your cameras for the time being just to sort of reduce the drag on people's uh, internet. We'll hold questions till the end. Uh, if you open the participants list, you'll see a little raise hand option. I can call on you that way, or you're welcome to post things in the chat, and then I will get those things to Sergio uh, at the end of the talk. If you're curious about who else we have coming to speak this fall, I'd encourage you to go to the web link there on the Human Environment Systems page. We've got a lot of great speakers. Uh, mostly those talks are all on Wednesdays, but today is a special occasion. Uh, lastly, I just want to say that um, Summer has been a pretty rough one between continued uh, racial violence in the country, the ongoing pandemic, and now the uh, eruption of wildfires across the West. Everyone is feeling a little bit thin. Uh, I'm gonna just ask that you be kind to each other and to yourselves. We're not gonna tolerate any sort of uh, harassment or abuse, um, but please don't make me explain what that means. I just want to say that uh, with all of those things going on, we're incredibly grateful to have you joining us and spending an hour of your day here. Uh, I'm also extremely grateful to be able to introduce my friend Sergio Avila. Sergio is currently the Local Outdoors Program Coordinator for the Sierra Club, where his work focuses on expanding access to outdoors and nature in order to improve uh, people's well-being and also strengthen their connection to the planet. Sergio uh, has a master's degree in arid lands management from the University of Baja, California, and has worked on conservation efforts around the U.S.-Mexico border, borderlands for over 20 years on species ranging from monarch butterflies to jaguars and ocelots. <clears throat> he is a Wilberforce Conservation Science Fellow and a certified wildlife tracker. He has served on the board of the Sonoran Joint Venture, as well as the uh, Equity and Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity Board for the Society of Conservation Biology since its inception. Uh, he is currently uh, serving on the City of Tucson's Commission on Climate, Energy, and Sustainability, as well as being the president for his Sugar Hill Neighborhood Association Board and on the leadership team for the Progressive Workers Union uh, Coalition of Employees of Environmental NGOs uh, across the US. Sergio is an impassioned advocate, uh, a hell of a wildlife biologist, and a wonderful storyteller. We're really glad to have him here. With that, I'll let you take it away, Sergio. Thank you so much, Matt. Gracias. Gracias for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, very honored to be part of this seminar series. Very nervous to be the first one, but let's just gonna set the bar high and I'm very much looking forward to this whole series. I'm very impressed with the lineup you have and I will be watching this, this series as well. Um, thanks everyone for being here. I think the introduction is comprehensive enough. Uh, I'm not going to talk more about myself. Uh, I will address this photograph that I used to introduce myself in different things. One, because it's my way of breaking the ice before we even meet. I like to use humor in a lot of the very heavy stuff that I say. Uh, and at the same time, I also try to make the point in some areas at least that crazy cat people are not only crazy cat ladies and that it is problematic uh, and not inclusive uh, to only think that it's crazy cat ladies. We are all crazy cat people and I uh, represent myself as one of them. Uh, always thinking about inclusion and, and equity. Uh, I also want to tell you all that I'm speaking to you from Toono Odam and Pascuayaki lands, uh, ancestral lands and current lands in the Sonoran Desert. These are indigenous lands uh, that, that are bisected by an international border and there are dynamics and there are systems happening to these people today that affect their daily lives depending on uh, the policies and the size of the, size of the border they're in. 
Um, come on, arrows. Um, my arrow is not changing, but I will tell you that I grew up in central Mexico. I went to school, biology school, in the University of Aguascalientes. There we are. Um, and huh, yes, I went to school in the University of Aguascalientes, and I have a master's degree from Baja California. But I really like to say that I don't like to be defined uh, for my work or for my professional background. I am also an immigrant. I am also a trail runner. I am also an uncle. I am also a son, a brother, a husband. I am the happy um, owner or um, co-owner of three cats in a desert tortoise. And all of these things come together in me. I don't wear different hats but instead I have different layers. All of those layers inform who I am and how I present myself. So I'm not only defined by my science degrees or knowledge or experience, much less by my papers, because I don't have very many, uh, but I really like to say that um, as an overall person, I have a lot of other intersections in my identity that actually matter for this presentation too. I grew up in central Mexico in the land of the Zacateco people, and uh, I have, trying to reconnect and learn about who the Zacateco people are, uh, what are my own origins and roots, uh, in addition to having a traditional Western education and culture the way I grew up. So in this sense, I am trying to decolonize the way that I've grown up and the way that I learned to uh, have a better understanding of who I am and, and who my roots are. In my traditional career as a scientist, one of the most uh, passionate things I have done and interesting, I think, is my study on jaguars. I grew up really trying to become a, a biologist. Being a biologist was my dream from a child. And one of the things I really wanted to do was study jaguars. So the photographs you are seeing here are of a jaguar that I did see in the mountains of Mexico in Sonora in 2003. Um, I like to say in this photograph that it's a little blurry because the camera got nervous that we, we were in front of a Jaguar. Uh, but it was a tremendous experience that you can read about in this paper called The Jaguar and the PhD. I shared it in our Slack channel, so you are welcome to check it out there. By the way, some people have asked me about this photograph to ask if that cat is alive. That cat is alive and, and just uh, anesthetized. It's a female that we attach a radio collar and then we're able to follow for a few months later. Uh, this work with wildlife ha also put me on the, on the monitoring of those jaguar corridors of jaguars that we knew in Northern Mexico and connecting with the location where jaguars were uh, seen or recorded in Arizona and, and New Mexico, north side of the border. So with that in 2007, I started a project to monitor the wildlife of the borderlands using the remote cameras. I actually started with film cameras where you only had 36 opportunities of success and then moved on to digital cameras where you can have 2000 images of grass moving in front of the camera. So technology has allowed us to monitor a lot of that, those places, especially rich remote locations where we cannot conduct uh, direct research. And through these cameras, I was able to connect with landowners and really share and mostly learn from landowners about their local knowledge of the land, of the species, of the uses of the land, etc. So uh, this was not only a research for me to find something, it was also a research project for me to learn something. So here I'm sharing you some, sharing some uh, photographs of the species from the Sonoran Desert. All of these photographs are from south of the border. Uh, some of them uh, a few miles from the border, some of them up to 30 miles from the border. One highlight of this study that I was able to run for 10 years was finding ocelots in the northernmost range of their distribution in the continent, but also finding ocelots moving in the snow. I will not say that uh, this is indicator of much more than a tropical species adapting to changing conditions, but I think it, it, uh, it's an example of a line of research that could be followed in terms of what are the current impacts of climate change into species that are moving farther north and north in their distribution range. Uh, but that work with ocelots also allowed us to collect a lot of new information on a subspecies that wasn't well known. 
And I also share one of those articles with you in the Slack channel, so you're welcome to visit a publication on um, sonoran ocelots. The work on monitoring corridors for jaguars was successful uh, after many years of trying. I told you that I started in 2007, and it took uh, between three and four years to photograph our first jaguar in that location. Uh, here are four images uh, in the very same location of two different jaguars, which really changed the face of this project and gave us a lot more visibility. But very important, gave more visibility to the landowner, the rancher of this, uh, of this place that was um, conducting management, land management and practices that actually allowed the jaguar to thrive in this place. The first photograph we took of an ocelot, uh, he didn't know what ocelots were, but with one photograph of an ocelot, when I told the, this rancher where we found it, he immediately decided that 150 head of cattle would be removed from that canyon in order to give that uh, space to the ocelot and to make it a, a heaven a corridor and a, and a habitat territory for this ocelot. And I share this story because we don't hear this type of stories from, uh, of conservation from ranchers and much less from Mexico. It's very important to know that um, land in Mexico is not public. So it's not like you uh, go and do a study in a national forest or in uh, Bureau of Land Management lands. In Mexico, you have to go knock on the door, you have to shake hands, drink some local coffee and kiss babies um, in order to enter these lands where really the credit, absolute credit of these species living in those places go to the ranchers that do some management there. And in this case, I wanna show you the diversity of species in one location where we set up these remote cameras. Notice that at the bottom of all these photographs, there's two gray rocks and it's all along a creek. So these five photographs are taken in the very same spot and it shows the great diversity of species uh, in that place. It allowed us to monitor about uh, between 25 and 30 species of mammals. And it was all that research that took a while and, and uh, we kept going. It helped us solidify our relationship with the rancher and it turned into a, a really good conservation project. In addition to monitoring wildlife, I have also dedicated some time into habitat restoration. So here I'm also showing you photographs of a river that uh, the headwaters of this river start in southern Arizona and this river flows south. It crosses the international border and then makes a U-turn and flows north, coming even by Tucson, Arizona. So this is that river. This is the Santa Cruz River on the Mexico side, on the U, uh, where people in Mexico are working on restoration of uh, riparian habitat for birds, for themselves, for water, to protect from erosion. And it is uh, activities that it was very interesting to see for people understanding that the benefit of this restoration was not only for humans, but also uh, for wildlife. From the biology side, we thought, the benefit of this is for wildlife and also for humans, but uh, the benefit is both ways and that's something to, to keep in consideration. And that benefit also expands to the fact of improving the quality of life and the opportunities for other people to be exposed to nature, to enjoy the outdoors, to learn about these natural systems. And in a way, possibly a few years later, get to where many of you are in your careers trying to get a degree, write a thesis, do some research in some of these places. So exposing people to the outdoors and to nature um, in a safe, comfortable way has been a, a form in which I have been able to attract other people into a science career. I also had the opportunity to work with monarch butterflies. And though I won't tell you much about monarch butterflies, what I do want to share is highlight how this is a species that uh, occupies a range throughout North America. It goes through three countries. And of course, this migration has happened for millennia. Uh, scientists like to say that there was one guy who discovered this uh, uh, migration about 40, 45 years ago. But of course, that migration was happening for centuries. So indigenous people throughout this migratory corridor already knew about the monarch, already knew about this messenger, and already knew about the, the needs of this butterfly to continue their migration 
and their generations. So I bring it up because this is where equity in science and, is, and inclusion does not bring in uh, traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge where local people already knew about the existence of this. But for monarch scientists, it's like they just discover it and they take credit for that. The other part that extremely bothers me is that even though the wintering grounds of the monarch butterflies are in central Mexico, even though that's a protected area, it's a national park, it has a budget, it is well known, it's well visited. Look at how this map is very colorful in the United States and in Canada, but in Mexico it's just gray full of question marks. And as a scientist, I think it's very irresponsible to publish things like this because Mexican scientists feel like we are erased and invisible for the work that we do when clearly these species uh, also go to those countries. So it's very important that as scientists, we credit other people, non-scientists, non-peer review literature to understand that we acknowledge that other people know about this and that the butterflies exist. Those question marks do not signify lack of uh, butterflies. What they, what they show is lack of people looking for the butterflies. But uh, I had the pleasure to work in communities in Northern Mexico where we did some training on butterflies and immediately started reporting and documenting butterflies throughout Northwest Mexico. So a little bit of effort in training brought up a great power um, of 25 or 30 biologists from different national parks, from protected areas, from voluntary private lands. Um, and all of them learned how to identify butterflies and represented about five states in Northwest Mexico. So with that, we created a huge network of people documenting monarchs with the idea of getting rid of those question marks on the map. The other part that I really like to work on is breaking the narrative uh, of fear and violence about work in Mexico, breaking the narrative of, of uh, scary stories or, or thinking that anything that happens in Mexico is just bad news. I just shared with you news of a rancher who took cattle out of a place because he found an ocelot. It is this person on the cover of High Country News. So whereas I have not uh, published a lot of peer review literature, I have been very interested in elevating the stories and the successes of other people who are also benefiting uh, uh, wildlife species and habitats. And for that matter, addressing climate change, mitigation of climate change, education, uh, scientific opportunities for other people. So it's been very important to me to change the narrative uh, about Northern Mexico and its connection to Southern United States, Southwest United States, in really highlighting those people who are doing great actions, but who are not in the scientific conference, who sh don't show up in the peer review literature or journals, but are there doing the work, planting the trees, identifying the birds, and having people have a great experience like these bird watchers that we took for a day trip into Mexico. So to me, it's very important that we highlight the local people and their abilities and their, um, uh, their work to improve conservation opportunities. But while I was working, all of those uh, stories, by the way, are in US media, but they are all from Northern Mexico. But while I was going back and forth for those 10 years to do my studies, to set my cameras, to look for Jaguars, to talk at universities, uh, or schools or to talk to local groups, I was also crossing the international border. And little by little, um, in, in, at the end of the 2000s and beginning of this decade, we have seen the escalation of the buildup of this infrastructure, uh, blocking the corridors, destroying habitat, and impacting the natural movements of plants and animals in this region. Uh, to me, it was very evident to see that the, the blockage of corridors, the lack of access for this deer to, de to reach water or grass was very impacting for those animals. And I always saw it as a scientist, uh, understanding uh, how it is that they cannot migrate because of climate change, they cannot adapt to climate change, they cannot go and find new territories, they might not have access to water and grass. Uh, so I'm showing you some of those images of species along the border. This is an aerial photograph from 2010 uh, of the San Pedro River. On the, on the lower side is the south side of the border, so Mexico, 
on the upper side is the United States. And you will notice how much in the Arizona side, there's a network of roads. It's, it's a road along the border. It's a wall and it's a network of roads. And you can even see the border patrol vehicles there. This is a national riparian conservation area that they are absolutely destroying and impacting today. And the border wall now crosses that river. This is a river that also flows north from the mountains in northern Mexico into Arizona. It is called the San Pedro River. So I share this because the land is the same, the trees are the same, uh, the hydrology works the way it's supposed to, animals move the way they're supposed to, but the impacts on the land are very clear, especially from the air, and go beyond just the border wall and go also as to habitat, destruction, erosion, and many other impacts uh, on these lands. This is an example of a mountain lion that I have a feeling was being chased by a border patrol uh, truck along the road on the wall, and they took these photographs. But it's just an example of the type of stress that big and small species are under in this, in this region. Uh, here's an example of a Sonoran toad that would not be able, is not able to cross that infrastructure. So as I share these impacts with you, these are environmental impacts, the destruction of the Sonoran Desert, the destruction of saguaros, which are uh, apartment buildings for pygmy owls, for, for woodpeckers, uh, for elf owls, for uh, purple martins, and many other bird cavity nesting species that occupy these saguaros. By destroying saguaros, we're also destroying the homes of those species. Additionally, saguaros are a, a sacred plant and an ancestor for people, for indigenous people in the desert. So this is a desecration of not only uh, natural systems and the desert, but it's a desecration of cultural values and indigenous knowledge in the region. You can also see on the top right, a photograph where the border wall accumulated debris uh, blocking a, a creek or blocking a, a, yeah, a temporary creek, a wash. And with the debris accumulated and the mud, it's, it actually cre creates a dam where water starts bouncing back against the wall and growing, growing, growing until the weight of the water takes over the wall. It sounds great to think of the destruction of this place, of the destruction of this wall, but I'll tell you that, that those millions of gallons of water created very serious economic impact and environmental impact south of the border in communities who cannot defend themselves or bring the Department of Homeland Security or the United States to task on this. So it is devastating impacts, not only to wildlife, but to water, to uh, the watersheds, to the hydrology, and to, to climate change as a whole in this place. And as I said, um, many of these things were only environmentally related, but as I was crossing back and forth on the border, I realized that I was a, I was a target also, that as a person of color, um, my, my field companions, my, my field techs, were never harassed by the Border Patrol. They were never asked for extra papers. They were never asked for extra documentation, even if they had less education than I did or a different role in my, in my team. And yet I was the one always having to answer the extra questions, showing the extra documents. And this is the answer of why I changed working in conservation science to working in social justice, because I see myself reflected in those kids, in those families who are separated. I see myself reflected in the refugees asking for help at the border because they cannot live in communities in Central America where climate change is really affecting them and, and policies that have been there for decades. Because I see myself affected and my family and the future of Jaguars if these kids in Guatemala or in Central America or in Mexico, they could be the biologists, they could be the scientists, they could be the decision makers. They could be the governors and the presidents, and they could be the biologists and the managers, but you know what? They're not. They're not. They're not going to be. So the future of the Jaguar right now, the future of environmental conservation is in cages along the border in the United States because people are having to go leave their lands, and this is the way they are welcomed to this country, especially the cartoon where I remember working and identifying Jaguars in 2000 and uh, maybe 16 
a jaguar was killed in Mexico, a jaguar was killed in northern Mexico, a jaguar that had been photographed in the mountains in Arizona. It was identified by the spots in its body. Different remote cameras photographed this cat. And one time we found out that this jaguar had been killed in Mexico. And the environmental community went berserk about this one jaguar that was killed. It was so unfair. How can they do this? We need to bring justice. But you know what? It was the same summer that the current administration separated families and left kids and migrant kids in detention in cages. I felt that personal. That was personal to me. My own community of scientists, of conservationists, of nonprofit organizations that have supported my work as a jaguar biologist did not support me as a migrant, did not support me as a person of color, and did not see the pledge of people like me trying to come to this country to find better opportunities for ourselves. I had the privilege of coming with an education. I had the privilege of coming uh, speaking English. I, I came higher with the university. I didn't come here to look for a job. They grabbed me from Mexico because I could do things that people in the United States could not do. And yet, I am still the person who, while leading those trips, I'm the only one who has to answer questions from the Border Patrol. I'm the only one who is profiled. I'm the only one who has to explain my presence in this place. I became a citizen in 2016 precisely just to avoid this type of harassment. Not because I'm proud of being part of this country. Do not congratulate me about being part of this country. Congratulations to you all that I'm part of this country because it is migrants that are bringing a new way of thinking and breaking the paradigm of what other people think about us. So this is a very trigger uh, warning, trigger uh, photograph to me, but this is the answer to the, the title of this presentation is why did I change from conservation? Because in conservation, I was only visible if I was a scientist, but I was not accepted as a person of color with an accent, with English as a second language and many other things. And there's a little bit more. Uh, the people in the United States need to reckon with their uh, honoring of these uh, uh, thought leaders. So I'm gonna read you a quote of one person who is considered a thought leader in the environmental movement. And, um, and it says, it might be wise for us as American citizens to consider calling a halt to the mass influx of even more millions of hungry, ignorant, unskilled, and culturally, morally, genetically impoverished people especially when these uninvited millions bring with them an alien mode of life, which, let us be honest about this, is not appealing to the majority of Americans. Therefore, let us close our national borders to any further mass immigration. The means are available. It's a simple technical military pro problem. And the author of this is Ed Abbey, who is revered throughout the Southwest as an author, inspiring author of conservation and uh, famous misogynist too, not only racist, but misogynist. I am asking each one of you in academia and wherever you go, stop using these role models. Stop using these inspire, inspiring people because they don't inspire the rest of us. I identify with the people that he is talking about. He wrote this in the 70s, and this has been in the psyche of American public, especially his readers, white people who adore him, and I'm gonna tell you, these type of authors and these type of writings is very insulting. So this is another answer of why, as a scientist, I'm not comfortable being identified with the conservation community because the conservation community is comfortable being identified with Ed Abbey. But there's more when my slides go. Um, come on, slides. Um, I will also show you, let me just, come on. There we go, okay. Uh, yes, when you diminish people and people's humanity and don't understand why somebody would be willing to put themselves through this pain, I think most of you might be able to have an idea and relate to this pain. When you dehumanize people as hungry, ignorant, unskilled, then that allows you to, to have people waste people. And this is a very interesting article written by somebody at Sierra Club, the title of which is racism is killing the planet. When we allow to have waste areas where we're going to drill, where we're going to dump, uh, where we're going to destroy, we are saying those places and those people are not valuable. So we give ourselves permission to go destroy those places. 
So we need to see people for their humanity, not for what we think they do for us or not. There is a reckoning that this country needs to do. White people need to look themselves in the mirror and realize that you did not discover anything and that um, there is no such thing as God, uh, as a God message for you to come and uh, colonize this country. There are people who have been here for centuries, for millennia, with their knowledge, with their societies, with their buildings, with their cultures, with their food, uh, with their ceremony, and it needs to be addressed and acknowledged that uh, that that knowledge and that those people need to be included in anything that has to do with conservation. There's a lot of knowledge that is not being used. And in that sense, we also are confronting currently uh, the legacy of the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club is the organization where I work, uh, and the Sierra Club was founded by John Muir. Many of you might have heard about John Muir as this country's most famous and influential naturalist and conservationist. He taught people of his time and ours the importance of experiencing and protecting our natural heritage. His words have heightened our perception of nature. His personal and determined involvement in the great conservation questions of the day was and remains an inspiration for environmental activists everywhere. Well, yeah, that's what they teach us in school. That's what they tell us about. But they never tell us about the opinion of John Muir um, on, of, of indigenous people. So this is a quote from John Muir, a strangely dirty and irregular life. These dark eyed, dark haired, half happy savages lead in this clean wilderness. See how in one sentence, there's so much judgment for people. Dirty, irregular life, uh, half happy, savages, and yet the wilderness is clean. That is the contrast. That is the, that is the narrative that we're working against. That is the foundation of the conservation movement that was visionary into the future, but it was narrow because it only wanted certain people to enjoy those places. So yeah, he is credited, credited as the father of the national parks. He is credited as a visionary inspiring influential conservationists. He helped create the national parks and so many other things. But you know what? I challenge that the national parks are America's best idea. Ask any indigenous community and those who remember their grandparents telling them how they were removed, how they had to leave those places. The Grand Canyon had people living in there and they were removed in order to create America's best idea. So I don't think it's America's best idea. I think it might be America's worst idea, not one of the best. But hey, Ken Burns sells documentaries about it, right? So somebody's making a buck about it. Not, not it. So one of the uh, things that we are doing at Sierra Club is elevating the voices of indigenous people to really change this idea that conservation only deals with the environment and that people belong somewhere else. Forget about those photographs of Yosemite with a waterfall in a valley with no people. We need to think about these places. We need to think about these wilderness areas as not pristine. There was no such thing as pristine wilderness. The reason why it was in the conditions that it was found and that it was described is because indigenous communities kept it that way. They manage fire, they manage water, they manage food resources, they even graze uh, bison and elk in order to hunt them and yet hunt them in a sustainable way. So it's a, it's a time to change the narrative of conservation into understanding that we need to center somebody else's voices, somebody else's knowledge to give more value to conservation and break that idea that social justice belongs somewhere else. The Sierra Club continues to work with the Wichin defending the Arctic, what you might know as the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It is the the ancestral and current lands of the Wichin nation who uh, live connected to the calving grounds of caribou. That is the threat. Their, life, their lives are the threat, not our capacity to enjoy and visit the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It is the livelihood of people who have been there connected to caribou for millennia. The same thing with the water protectors uh, and, and uh, White Mesa in, in the Four Corner area working with uh, indigenous communities to address the issues that, that affect them. So in this case, I really wanted to get to this because I was thinking this morning, I saw your introductions, 
Uh, everybody describes the work that you are doing. Um, it sounds very interesting. You use very scientific words. I challenge everyone, everyone to do again your introduction video, but like you're presenting to yourself 15 years ago. So don't use scientific terms. Talk to your grandparents. Talk in a way that you will relate to other audience. Uh, do the same introduction, but say it in a different way. So here's this exercise. I was thinking about human environment systems, this unit that you are all part of. And I think we are clear about the human part and we are clear about the environment part. But you know what I discovered? What is the hyphen? I think all of you, each one of you who describe what your research is about, you are working on the hyphen. You create that hyphen. So that hyphen means scientific research, what you're working on, some of you, is scientific research. That is what connects those two big entities, human and environment. Um, management is another way of understanding what that uh, hyphen is. And it is land management, water management, uh, policy, uh, I mean, agencies, etc. Policy, some people are very interested in affecting policy uh, for the benefit of human and environment. But what does it do? What does it mean? What is that hyphen about affecting policy? And I want to expand on the, the meaning of that hyphen too. Recreation, it's part of the human and environment system. So when you are thinking about your research, don't only focus on the academic scientific management policy side of things. Also think about the effects and impacts on the opportunities for all to enjoy some of those places. Always think about the extractive uses between the human and environment systems that happen by the cattle industry, by the oil and gas industry, even by the border wall. The border wall defines the hyphen of human and environmental systems. Another way that defines those is the cultural values. We cannot forget traditional ecological knowledge uh, food uh, that includes also food, the knowledge of food, knowledge of medicine, ceremonies, sacred places, um, and land and water sovereignty. That is also part of the human and environment system. And that is also something that needs to come as a whole into your work as a scientist in the research that you're doing in order to make sure that you are respecting those lands, that you are respecting that knowledge, and that you are bringing in some of that knowledge to inform your own work. And with that, I think it's extremely important that we acknowledge the land and water protectors, so-called activists. I find it so interesting that as soon as we don't work for a university, even if I have a science degree, people call me an activist. But PhDs won't call themselves activists. We're all activists. We are all activists. But when we create these labels, because some have a degree and some not, it's like we become more important or less important. And I want to elevate the importance of the land and water protectors. For example, those who fought uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline in Standing Rock, those who are fighting other pipelines in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, like the Wichin, those who are fighting the border wall, like the Odom, and even the national and international issue of missing and, missing and murder indigenous women and girls, which is a serious issue that has no visibility in the conservation arena and yet is very connected to the conservation arena. When you think about those extractive uses, uh, think about the man camps that are created in indigenous lands, remote areas that are not, uh, uh, that are not easy to keep in law enforcement and all of the injustice that goes in those places. So when indigenous people don't necessarily react to your very interesting topics of research, might be because they are interested in missing and murder people that they have lost. So we need to understand that that hyphen of the human and environmental systems also means that we need to understand the local priorities, the local challenges, the local threats, and not only use our science and our degrees to answer a question that for local people might not be interesting or might be interesting at a different level. Personally, I feel like my work uh, as a bridge between uh, conservation work in Mexico and the US is a way of facilitating collaboration. I don't wanna be the, the, the author of the papers. I don't wanna be the, the I don't, don't wanna have the diploma. 
I don't wanna have a conference presentation, but I will love to bring people together to break those barriers and to work with each other um, in order to really engage and involve in the environment conservation without borders. I have found a lot of conservation groups in the United States who are very interested in jaguars, but they're only interested in jaguars if they are north of the border. South of the border, who knows what happens? But like, it's like they care uh, as if jaguars knew that they are in the United States. Jaguars don't, monarch butterflies don't. So that's a perspective that I would like to, to share. Ultimately, uh, a lot of these migrating species uh, like butterflies, also represent the migration of people. And the migration of people has happened also for centuries. This is not just because America has so many opportunities. This is because indigenous communities always traveled, always exchanged, always traded with each other. And the movement of human and natural systems is a natural phenomenon of migration. So we need to elevate that phenomenon to really bring into our language the understanding that there's no separation between the human and the natural environments. Some of you might say that you work for, for future generations and you might identify yourself with the future generations in this photograph. I love that photograph of the little black bear uh, a few miles from the international border. Uh, and I also love the photograph of the little girl who came to a festival and wanted to be a butterfly. Those are the generations that we are working with not one or the other, but the benefits to one will benefit the other. And I invite you to consider those things in your research. Ah. With that, uh, I'm going to leave it there. I would love to have some questions. Uh, remember that Matt uh, created the, the Slack channel so we can have some interaction over there also, but I'm really interested to hear your questions now. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can see each other. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thanks, Sergio. For those of you who are wondering what the Slack channel is that, that Sergio is referring to, uh, that's a space for the students who are registered in our current seminar uh, to be able to engage in a longer discussion. I will send out all of the um, references that he listed, but I would encourage those of you who uh, want to have this conversation now to, to join in and not put it off until the Slack channel. We still have probably 18 to 20 minutes left. And if you'd like to uh, ask a question, you can either raise your hand in the participants list or just turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Uh, I think we can try that and should be able to avoid a free for all, hopefully. So maybe I'll just start uh, while folks are thinking. And I guess, Sergio, I think you, you cover a lot. Um, and maybe one of the things that um, the beginning of your talk made me think about is, uh, you know, we sort of talk about that gray area, the question marks in, in Mexico when we're thinking about monarch conservation. And I wonder if you could speak about um, lessons the American environmental community could learn from conservation and stewardship south of the border um, in terms of both stories of private landowners, but also like how people organize and, and build um, strategies to, to conserve wildlife in places. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, that's a good question. It's something we don't hear very often. I would say that the lesson is, as a scientist and as a, as a citizen of the United States, is be humble. Uh, don't buy all that stuff that say number one and uh, always ahead and all that stuff, because it makes you believe that even as a scientist, you're a better scientist than other people, or that because you're a scientist, you know more than other people. I would say be humble. Equal. Um, one of my things really is that I realized that by being a scientist and only hanging out with scientists, the experience at some point was very limited and the, the conversations started turning very boring. Nobody else talks about movies. They don't wanna talk about Beyonce. They don't wanna talk about being, you know, they just wanna talk about the sixth leg of the butterfly and the latest publication of so-and-so and what conference they're going to attend. So like start finding different influence in your life to make it an overall uh, knowledge. There are so many positive stories in Mexico of people voluntarily, voluntarily, not like TNC that gets paid to do that, voluntarily putting their land for conservation and allowing researchers, allowing schools, allowing uh, 
government agencies to come and help with the management of that. They don't get money for that. It is a voluntary effort to be willing to put your land out there for Jaguars to pass through or for Jaguars to live there, to acknowledge, accept that there might be some losses of cattle. And yet, if you keep a good uh, herd of deer, you might uh, mitigate those problems. There are so many examples of people who have voted in community meetings to go for conservation and to go for uh, restoration practices, watershed management. And those are stories that we don't hear in the United States. There are so many stories of community leaders really speaking up for their communities to talk about water contamination, water pollution, and other things. I just realized that also in the human environment systems, we also have to address people who live in cities with bad air quality. We always like to say that national parks provide us with clean air and clean water. Not everybody gets to go and not everybody gets to live with clean air. The south of the city of Phoenix has serious problem of air pollution and that is in the city. It is both an environmental and a social justice issue. So um, yeah, some of those are some of the examples, but I would say that um, be willing to learn from other people, be willing to understand their values, even if they don't fit within your values, to, to improve and uh, uh, broaden the knowledge that you can have uh, that will be applied in your research eventually. Thank you. I'm just going to scan for hands in this list of things. When I was in school, I didn't have the opportunity to have these kind of seminars, definitely not the technology. Um, so I will say, Matt, you're doing a great job by offering this because it's something that some of us didn't have. And uh, it, is, it is really an honor to take this opportunity. I never thought that I would be the person speaking. I was always the person attending uh, somebody else. So um, I really value this. And I say this because it's also an opportunity for you to uh, have a conversation, like ask me your questions, tell me where you're coming from, tell me what you don't agree with. Uh, I think Jamie is coming. Did I put you on the spot? Just remember to unmute yourself. Yeah. No, you can finish your, your thought uh, there before I oh, talk. I, actually, my thought was just poking on somebody who would be willing to turn the camera on and share something. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Your talk and presentation was amazing and spoke really deeply to a lot of values that I have that drew me to Hess in the first place. Um, I think one of your, one of the articles that I read, you talked about doing applied science and the importance of that in terms of getting out of the silo of just the conservation academic sphere. Um, but my question for you is thinking about doing applied research or research that hopefully can be applied to something. Um, I'm working on uh, bison reintroduction research, mm -hmm. hopefully with the Anscapi Pagani um, and Kainai and Blackfoot Confederacy. Um, but how to go about doing, you know, empirical scientific research in a anti-colonial and anti-racist way and how like something that I've been really trying to think through is how to do that and how explicit that should be within my research goals while still getting funding. <laughs> um, wow. So if you have any insight as to how to navigate that or kind of what you would like to be seeing current and future researchers do and say um, in regards to those types of issues. Uh, wow, this is a big one and it, bring, it brings in a lot of things. Uh, one, I would say is that as scientists, as people who are enrolled in school, you already see a window of how long it's gonna take you to get your degree, right? Like you're estimating, I don't know, two years, five years, you do have a window. But when you go to local communities, they don't have your timeline. So one thing we need, to, we need to get used to is that not everybody moves at our speed. We might move faster or they might move faster. And also not everybody moves in the same direction. We might start going in different directions. So I would say that it's very important to understand what our common ground is, understand what our common values and interests are, and then focus on that. You will eventually focus on your diploma and keep going and present. 
but like the focus of your collaboration with all those communities need to center them in and in their interests and their priorities in what you are doing don't center your phd degree don't center your thesis i did that and it was you will read it in my paper but I center myself, my diploma, my, my success, and a Jaguar died for that. And I lost my degree for that. And so if we center those communities, their timelines, their interests, we are able to address a little bit of that. The other thing is about decolonizing is ask them. <laughs> when you find common values, uh, you have to create a relationship of trust in which they will be willing to tell you, you know what? No, we don't wanna go that way. Uh, sometimes you need to have both, but I think that it's important to understand and share with everybody that science or traditional knowledge are not going to be one more important than the other. For you, one might be, but don't, let's not erase or forget the other one. But finding common values, common ground, I think it's, it's one. The timeline, that really, like we are so set with timelines um, that sometimes we just focus on that and, and, and it bothers other people. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Sheila posted one in the chat because her internet is kicking her out. Um, she says, Sergio, it's hard to be the person of color who decolonizes a subject area or organization. What support systems have helped you do this work? Uh, many um, and not very many. Actually, I feel like I'm just learning about this. I feel like I'm uh, just being exposed to this because in Mexico, I live with a lot of privilege. Uh, I am a heterosexual male. That is the best identity. Uh, you can have the safest identity you can have. But until I started feeling oppression, like I did at the border, like I did in different jobs, until then I started realizing that I could use my privilege to elevate somebody else. But uh, as, as support systems, it is, it is sometimes my friends, uh, out of which Matt is one of a group of 20 where we created this uh, in the fellowship, we created a support system. I also have a family and I have a support system. I also feed my energy uh, when I see the struggle of indigenous communities, black and indigenous communities who have been oppressed for so many years that my pain today, it's minimum, it's nothing compared to the historical trauma that a lot of people are going through. I also am willing to put myself out there because I had the privilege of having parents who went to college. I don't think I said this in the beginning, but my parents are medical doctors. So I had role models. It was very easy for me to go to the college. I used to go to their university classes when I was five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old. Like I was always present there. So that wasn't a challenge, but I want to use that privilege to see somebody else and help them move forward. Uh, I don't think my success is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for success for everybody. So everybody's success is my success. So in that way, I'm trying to raise and, and create a community. And I hug my cats and I run a lot and I might watch a little bit too much TV. Uh, that might be a distraction system. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, so I'm gonna, I think Shannon also has a question in the chat that I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit to, to build on your answer to Jamie and, and maybe is a little bit more specifically focused on um, you know, when you're doing research on wildlife or plants that have sacred identities to the community you're working in, um, how do you start to approach conversations about collaring uh, a cat or coring a tree or harvesting seeds from a saguaro? This is great. I feel that part of my privilege is what I, share, I shared in the beginning. I use humor. Um, I also, uh, I try to be funny, I try, sometimes works. Uh, when your cameras are on, I can tell if I'm funny or not. Um, also, I try to connect with people where they are. I, again, I acknowledge my privilege as a scientist, but I am a person. I also was a child. I also was somebody's son. And so I try to be that person. That's why I challenge you all to introduce yourselves just as people. Forget about your degrees or your big words that you use to introduce yourselves. Just Think how you're gonna introduce yourself in a community without ever mentioning your, your university or your um, science background. Um, and then be interested in their interests. One of the things uh, I know we do a lot is that when we travel to a place, we bring our own water, our own food, our own coffee, our own. And sometimes local communities are like, 
really, you don't even trust us that you don't want to eat our food. So be willing to, 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 to take the steps that people are taking in that land. Try their food if they ask. Um, have, have, have a time with them where it's on schedule uh, work. And um, a lot of it is building trust, like really walk the talk. For what I'm saying, I have to be responsible of a lot of the things that I just said in this hour and walk the talk. And so I like to share stories. I like to talk about my parents. I like to bring in my cousins uh, and, and might not have to do with science, but allows me to connect with other people. Um, one, uh, one example, for example, uh, I really like to run and I'm a trail runner, but it has changed from just my physical activity to being a mental activity. It's what allows me to think, what allows me to connect with my own thoughts, with my own feelings. And it has allowed me to connect with other people who have lived in places for a long time. So it used to be just running and now it's like my ceremony. I go and take selfies with cactus because that's what I'm enjoying. And so it's just sharing some of those values. Be funny if you can, but if not, just try other things like cook if you like to cook, change a tire if you can change a tire, hold a baby if you can hold a baby. I mean, I'm just throwing, use your skills. Maybe that's, where, that's the best question. The skill that you have, use it. I was telling Matt earlier that my skill, the easiest skill, the, least, the least that, uh, that I can do is speak Spanish. Everything I just told you, I can say it in Spanish. That's the, the, the most minimum skill that I have. But every time I can, I bring it up and it helps create a network and engage other people and bring in other people and connect. For example, statistics is not my skill. So I never use graphs. I don't refer to R <laughs> or there's no probability of anything <laughs> because I don't do statistics. So use your skills, whatever skills you have. If you like to paint, invite other people to do art, um, to sculpture, uh, oh, whatever, whatever skill you have, use it to connect with people. Well, I think we are almost out of time. I want to give you any uh, a sort of last last option uh, for closing comments, and then I will um, close us out here in about two minutes and send around the link to the video as soon as it's ready. But I yeah. want to. Jody, did you want to say something? I saw you. I see you. Hi, Sergio. I'm Jody. Um, I'm here at Boise State. I do have a question. Um, yeah, so we get a lot of students um, who are interested in having a career like yours, um, not only being a scientist, but um, doing on the ground conservation work. Um, the problem is that the academic world in general isn't very good at training students in those other kinds of skills. We're really good at teaching students how to do statistics and write papers, um, but not so good at um, training them for a career in, with skills in the career that they might want to pursue, like in the nonprofit world. Um, so, but in human environment systems, what we're doing is, is we're structuring dissertations and master's theses so that students can get credit for engaging um, in activities that aren't just the typical scholarly research. Um, but we want to make sure that we're doing that right. And so my question for you is like when you're reviewing job applications, or let's say you were, would retire and you're going to hire your successor, um, what kinds of things would you be looking for on a resume? What kind of products, um, what kind of activities that that person would have engaged in that would make you say, wow, this person really gets it. This, this person has the skills and the experience to do this kind of on the ground uh, collaborative type of conservation work. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things I can think of, but one of them I would say is, as, as I've been saying the whole talk, breaking barriers. Which, which person introduces, presents themselves as a way that they will be breaking precisely this barrier. And so you're already sort of inheriting a legacy of doing things differently, let's say. Uh, identity. Like, I, we always say academia is this way, but we are the academics, so we need to take responsibility of how we are perpetrating that. So, so as an academic, I say, stop reading, stop suggesting all of the white authors and look for somebody else, see what happens. Um, bring in other books that are not just scientific 
uh, books. But in jobs, I also think that it's, a, it's about centering the service or the work that this person is going to do. And, you know, in job applications, one thing that is coming up is that sometimes we use words in the job descriptions that attract certain people. So uh, very easy examples are like when a job says, we're looking for a ninja ass kicker, uh, alpha wolf. Well, we already know that they're looking for a dude, right? Uh, it, it, so we need to be aware how even the language of the job description might limit the applicants. The other thing I will say, and as I, I just thought as you were saying you're reading these applications is that maybe find a different way of doing applications because to be honest, I would I have had more success on job applications that are in person than if I write them because I can feed myself from your feedback and we can have a conversation. So it's about the abilities of the person applying. Uh, but those are the super quick ones that I can that I can think of. I think there's something already about the terms to use or not use, and always thinking and expanding our our language so black and indigenous people of color feel included, feel like they are being called into that job. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. I was just going to close. Uh, really, thank you all for for this for this uh, opportunity, for this time. I am very happy to see people are, are excited on the chat. You know how to find me now. Uh, you know how to find me now and I'm here. Again, my success, even if I don't know you, is your success. So I want you to be successful. And finally, I will say that it's very important you feel you belong where you are. You are not fitting in somebody else's shoes. You are not fitting in somebody else's role. You are your own role. You are your own person. So belong where you are. You belong in academia. You belong in conservation. And you don't have to try to be like somebody else. And find role models that inspire you. If they're not scientists, find role models that inspire you. And also remember that you are a role model for somebody else. Somebody else is looking at you in your community, in your family, uh, thinking that they can be like you. So be responsible for that too. Have fun. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sergio. We'll see you next week. Yeah.